Hey, Tim. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> hey. Hi. And hello, Hi. everyone. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Welcome. to Welcome. episode <laughs> 158 of Dismembering Horror. The podcast, sure, were myself, Ryan Joseph McDuffie, and... <laughs> uh, myself, Timothy Ryan Aslan. That's right. Two Ryans between us. We dismember a horror film every episode. Indeed, we talk about what worked for us, what did not work for us, and anything else we found interesting or noteworthy about a horror film. That's just our framework for basically what's just friends getting together after watching a movie, after having a slumber party, staying up all night, watching horror films, picking them apart, saying, what was that all about? Ooh, yeah, that was good. Oh, yeah, that wasn't so good. All that good stuff. We like to think of it maybe as a a horror book club, but as a movie club, you know, where you watch these films with us and then dismember them with us. that's, That's kind of the spirit of it all. But whether you've watched the film or not, we welcome you all the same. Did you hear that? Did my stomach agrees with you? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Good. It's loud. Which means you on some uh, on some level agree with what I just said. (laughs) Your stomach is speaking for you. I think it means my stomach is ready to consume. You haven't um, eaten yet. Horror films. Oh, good. (laughs) You're about to satiate that appetite. Cool. (laughs) Tim, it's uh, as of recording this, the end of August, which means we're starting to get the sense of fall of Starbucks and their coffees that are pumpkin flavored and all sorts of stuff like that is in the air, which means when that's close, it also means that the end of the year is close. And when the end of the year is close, that also means the new year is close. And when the new year is close, we will have a new Scream film to dismember. I checked the date on Scream 5. It looks like it's January 11th. So just some advanced hype for that. I'm sure we'll be dismembering that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Scream. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Ghost face. yeah i like fall i like fall a lot i like haunted hay rides i like corn fields i like uh what else leaves falling off trees oh and stepping like the, on them i like that first uh smell of of fireplaces being used in the air you have I a like fireplace crisp, too it's so cool i, do. I have a yeah. fireplace I like that crisp air, that crisp, cool fall air. Um, I like sweaters. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I like mustaches. jackets. I'm all real, real love ja- just my deep, deep love and appreciation for a good jacket. I always get a new jacket every fall. Wow. You, you must know, have quite the collection. Change it up. Yeah. Uh, what else do I like? I, I like boots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all, all accessories. I like hats. I like wearing a little beanie. So now you're, yeah, you're just onto clothing now, but I agree. It's more fun to have, you have more to play with. You have more to accessorize with. It's cool. I agree. I like wa- I like going, I like going to the grocery store in Los Angeles in like, you know, early October and it's, it's like 60 degrees instead of 72 degrees and you get to see the one dude walking through the parking lot head to toe bundled up like hat parka gloves scarf <laughs> boots and you're like bro i'm like walking in in shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops <laughs> and this guy's all bundled up it's my favorite because people in la very quickly and i'm guilty of this but you very quickly your body sort of changes it's it's like sense of warm and cold 
Mm-hmm. And so some people just go, they go ham with it. You know, they, they're like, this is my, you know, my excuse to pull out every piece of warm clothing I own and put it on all at once. And it's right. 60. The flip, the switch has flipped over to cold scarf time. It takes me, you know, you need to get into the forties for me to be like bundling up. Yeah. But I like it when it gets to the forties. Yeah. That's more <laughs> January. <laughs> well, that was just also just my, my funny way of looking way ahead though. When we still are very much in summer as of recording right now, it's August is <laughs> yeah. still, is still here. <laughs> so oh, yeah. enjoy, enjoy it while, while you can get in your American movie, uh, American graffiti viewing as I like to do every so often during the summer. <laughs> To mark the end of summer. The other day. Huh? Yeah. I thought about watching that the other day. You should. Yeah, it's good. Uh, you know, before you go back to school, it's good to work yeah. in a viewing. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, Every man. Day for... is the the imminent before I go back to school. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's Feels never gonna way. happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, class is in session for for today, Tim. Oh, for okay. A- yeah, here we go. Are we the one- teachers? Yes, we're the teachers and the students. Wow. Hey. For episode 158 today, we traveled back to good old year of 1968, one of our favorite places to visit for horror films, which we recently did for Noroi the Curse and have done many times before. Went back to Japan for another film by director, filmmaker, Kaneto Shindo, who did Oni Baba, which we covered way back when. Double and, buy. <laughs> right. Good good rating for Oni Baba. Can he do it again in this quarter? Can they touch it? No. Uh, so that's good <laughs> for today is Kuro Neko with the original title from Japan, Yabu no Naka no Kuro Neko, which means a black cat in a bamboo grove which I guess is kind of like a phrase of a needle in a haystack kind of meaning. Probably not exactly like that, but something. Yeah, like that. It's, it's, I read this too. It has sort of an idiom sense to it where it's, it's not just the literal phrase, but it kind of also means like a, a mystery that's hard to solve or, or like a problem that's hard to wrap your head around kind of thing. Cool. But just as we know it Double here... Meaning. In the States and largely elsewhere, Kuro Neko, which translates to simply the black cat, which is <laughs> uh, the American title of another film we covered, Black Cat. Yep. So, all right. Well, we like to start as we do with the trailer for the film we're going to discuss. Tim, are you ready for that? I sure am. Great. All right. As I said, from 1968, written and directed by Kaneto Shindo. Here we go. Kuro Neko. を殺し、その生き地を殺すことが私たちの悲願です。そのために天地の魔人に願をかけたのです。あれが侍でなかったらの。お待たせ<笑> well, there we go, Tim, after that rousing trailer. We now move into our rating per our rating system. Would we tell ourse- ourselves to avoid this film, stream it, rent it, or buy it? Tim, who do you want to go first? You go first. I always go first. I'd tell myself to buy this film, Tim. I loved it. I thought you might. I thought you might. I thought you thought I might too. <laughs> Um, I think this is an f- amazing film. Why Why do you want to buy it? Yeah, we usually give a little in brief. It's, I mean, God, it's because of everything I have and <laughs> what worked. It's sort of cumulative <laughs> a lot. But 
I'm a sucker for any engaging ghost story. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this this is just that through and through is like watching an old Japanese folktale, which is just something I love so much in theory, come to life. Um, and it's basically just all the details within that that really won me over. Uh, like more, I guess so even more than just in theory where I'm a sucker for that. The execution too on every single level. I can, I don't know, I feel like I can only, can only speak about it in the details versus broad strokes. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I loved it. It was great. Well, I think it's great too. As per our way of looking at this, what would we tell ourselves? I'm still, a, I'm a rent, but I'm a, I'm, I'm the strongest rent you can get. I, it doesn't, it just doesn't quite tickle a, the thing that makes me want to buy things, and I'm not even sure really what that is. But it just, it doesn't. But I think it's a ex- extremely good movie or great movie. Um, it's just that boils down to a, a vague taste thing um, that I'm not a buy. But it's certainly worth owning if if it tickles you because it, it's so, so brilliant, brilliantly done. Actually, so, that, you know, it's one of a weird, weird one for me to be like, no, it's not a buy, but there, you should buy it. It's uh, actually you you putting it that way of being tickled by something does help me uh, does elucidate a bit how I can put how like the moment I knew it was a buy it. It's pretty much from the beginning, like as soon as you have those that first sequence of just ghost cat demon women flying through the forest <laughs> killing <laughs> men, pretty sweet. like that style and that everything yeah. about it. It was basically like, a, this is a buy it unless it sort of, you know, somehow really goes downhill from here. Uh, yeah. Which I was happy it didn't do. So <laughs> it won, that's what I could say. It already won me over from the beginning. Yeah. Cool. Great. Great. Well, we also like to summarize our films just to kind of get all on the same page. Or another way to put it, maybe, Tim, is just... What was this movie? What was this movie? This movie was... uh, Let's see. It's a lot of things. But I think at its core, it's sort of this commentary on war and loss and identity. And so the basic thrust of it is you've got this era of Japanese history warring. Um, what was it called? We, we talked about it in Onibaba too. It's sort of the, um, there's a term for this, uh, feudal. Is that the right word? I mean, we just kind of generally referred to the era it's set as feudal Japan, not knowing yeah. what that actually means. <laughs> right, exactly. Anyway, it's the time of, you know, it's basically civil war. It's like that. There's a time in Jap- Japanese history when there's a lot of infighting and between, you know, the people who are in charge and and you know this class of of warriors and the and the you know the rich and the poor and all that fun stuff. Anyway, yeah. so you've got samurai and they're essentially kind of roaming around trying to restore order but along with order and war comes you know good and bad and the so you've got the son uh, a mother and son and the son's wife they're very simple sort of peasants or farmers if you will and the son has gone off to war and that leaves his mother and her daughter-in-law just to sort of, you know, wait for him to come back, hope for the best, try to survive. And they are sadly um, attacked by a kind of roaming troop of samurai and raped and subsequently murdered by having their house set 
on fire and they burn in the in the uh in the inferno uh which is you know your basic construct of a horrible wrong being done to them because of this the spirit of the god of vengeance or the god of wrongdoing really the god of evil is how it's put in the subtitles of the film um sends a black cat or appears as a black cat and cuts a deal with them and the deal is they can continue to exist at night in their you know human forms uh in exchange for seducing and killing any samurai that comes along their path and they do that by you know kind of ushering them to their abode uh seducing them and then ultimately vampire style chomping on their throats drinking their blood and disposing of the bodies so this obviously (laughs) causes some trouble in town because now all of the quote unquote police like the samurai are sort of they're not really police but they're the they're the people who protect people um they're all getting killed (laughs) and everybody's freaked out about it and so the you know the what would you call him i don't know the 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 governor (laughs) or the head dude in town (laughs) says to the head samurai in town yo get get this under control and uh that samurai, um, he employs a a samurai who has just returned from a great battle um, to go kill this monster, whatever. the They don't know what it is doing this. They think maybe it's an, an animal, maybe it's a, a, a demon. They don't know. So they, they get this guy, um, Gintoki, and... They say, here you go. Here's your task. You're you're a great samurai warrior now. Go get him. Turns out he's the son that went off to war. He goes back to his um, home, which is now burnt. His mother and his wife are gone. And in, as you can imagine, in trying to figure out what's going on as well as... Um, setting out on his task to kill this demon he meets the embod or the you know the sort of current version of his mom and wife which is pretty freaky for him because he's like man you look just like my mom and my wife but like (laughs) you're totally ghosts what are we gonna do about this (laughs) and so it becomes this really interesting kind of pickle for him i guess of like what is real are you am i seeing reality are you actually my family or are you something else and uh you know he buys in he kind of ignores some red flags uh he gets with his he gets with his maybe wife maybe demon uh and It's real lovely, but of course there's a catch and the catch is, is that they're, so the, the two ghosts, their, their agreement with, um, the God of evil, uh, was that they, they had to kill all samurai, but he's a samurai. And so they've kind of gone back on their word here. And the cost of that is that his wife, um, only gets seven days with him. And so they make the most of it, but unbeknownst to him, then she's out, she's in hell. And that's a real, that's a real kick in the balls for him. But also then, you know, he, he's like, but mom, (laughs) you're, are you actually my mom? Is this real? What's happening? And we'll have to discuss the, the next sort of the 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 finale of this because i i'm i'm i have thoughts and i'm confused a little bit about the what the the actual reality of it is but it seems like he kind of realizes that his mom is yes his mom but also not his mom like kind of a demon version and and maybe it's all been a trick and so they have to have it out and they do which is you know imagine having to 
potentially kill your mom or at least kill an entity that is uh, presenting as your mom. Pretty gnarly stuff. But that's it. That's the movie. Woo! We got Woo! there. There's a lot. All right. <laughs> Great. Takes a, a rewarding sip from his coffee mug after all that. Th- thanks, Tim. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Great. Well, I got I got plenty to go right off of that for what works. So are you set for that? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Next big section. What worked? What worked? What worked for you? What worked for you? It worked like a charm, Smith. What worked for you? All right. Well, I did a train of thought there off of what you were saying that I think can, does allow me to lead to maybe an overarching thing why I love this story and therefore film so much. But it was when you said how, you know, a a demon presence, evil incarnate, whatever, shows up in the form of a cat and proposes this, yada, yada, yada. I was actually thinking, well, no, at the same time, those were also just cats that were already there. We have the reference of um, the, the husband in Toki, who said, oh, yeah, I remember just about that time we had a, before I left, we had a black cat that was a kitten at the time. So just kind of like, you know, what you ended up having to say, or it was like with as far as what the mother and daughter are, are they them? Are they a spirit? They're both kind of, sort of. That's same with, I think, what the black cat presence is. Is it that they are this evil? Is it that the evil kind of uses them as an access point? It's all intentionally mysterious and sort of, uh, I guess, awe-inspiring in a certain sense. Awe in terms of how nature is just something that, you know, has rules that are sort of beyond our understanding. And I think, yeah, what I love so much is and what uh, these Japanese horror films do so well and kind of inherently do a lot is they get at this like this interconnectedness between nature and and uh, the supernatural as far as this. They are all just nature beyond our understanding. And at any given point, like where where one thing starts and one thing ends, we don't know, you know. And that's that's. That's largely the crux of this story. Is they're questioning, what are you? What is this? How did this exactly happen? All that's on the forefront of this. So that's and that's that's probably most. If I had to pinpoint one thing, is what I'm such a sucker for. I'm trying to figure out more more ways to put it. I don't know, but but hopefully that gets at it. Maybe you have a different way of putting it. But yeah, just this unknowable but acknowledged interconnectedness like a, like a good example is that scene where once they have died from the fire after the attack and their bodies are just lying there we spend so much time just on these cats that appear and there's more than one of them they're they're going up on their bodies they're licking their faces but the time that we spent with them, it's not just like this little like, ooh, and then cats appeared. So then we know something happened. It gives us enough time to enough time to sort of feel like we're bearing witness to something is actively happening here. And whatever it is, is some magic or just, again, just nature in some weird, mysterious way connected to something supernatural beyond our understanding it's it's actively happening here and what it exactly is yeah we never are able to define so we don't yeah i i think that kind of in the same realm as that the thing that the thing that this story and i think a lot of the the japanese horror folk sort of based tales do is you've got this paradox of the perception of evil 
that's really wrapped up in balance. It's not about good and bad in sort of that's a, that's a subjective right like the samurai who are getting killed think that this thing that's killing them is evil because it's killing them but like it's there they started it <laughs> they were evil they did an evil thing they did i mean maybe evil is the wrong word but they did a thing that is is unacceptable right like they tipped out of balance the natural order of things you don't kill and you don't rape and kill people i mean you could do but they're in order to restore the balance of that wrong something needs like vengeance needs to be exerted and so to me that you see that a lot i mean most of these the japanese movies that we've watched cover this this notion of a great wrong that's been done and how to rebalance the scale um Kwai Don does it really well especially in that in that first one but like in all of them you know it's like there's there's a balance and a you know a risk and a cost to stepping out of balance so to me that that thread is is so strong in this one because the way that they present all of that is through Gingto Toki who has he's us he's like wait I don't know I don't understand what's going on and I'm not getting answers I have to try and figure it out and there is no real answer because every time he says I need to know what's going on to his mom she's like I can't tell you it's bigger than just an explanation it's the balance of the universe that's at stake here and like you kind of have to just go along with it and he like many humans in most sort of morality tales or whatever, he can't, he doesn't know what to do with that. And he fights it because he doesn't know anything else, which is so a big part of the broader, this broader um, kind of theme of men just don't get it. Like they, 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 they get into this single mindedness of like, Oh, I don't understand a thing. I'm going to fight it. Which is exa- or I, you know, I don't have I'm not balanced within myself as a, as a person and so I'm I'm doing things that are out of balance or that we would consider broadly wrong. Like I'm I'm exerting wrongs onto other people. That's a super you know uh what's the word? Sort of shadow side of humanity. And I think that's what I like about these stories is that they're really pushing toward this looking at the world through that lens of like, you've got your sort of basal shadow side. And then at the bottom and at the top, you have this sort of altruistic balanced, you know, it's not about you or the individual, it's about the broader world and finding that harmony. And these are all without like, overtly, you know, putting the finger in your face over it it just sort of like is imbued with that and you you know you walk away going oh man what a bummer <laughs> because largely i don't think in a lot of these stories the protagonist what i think is compelling about him is the protagonist doesn't necessarily learn the lesson they they leave having experienced the lesson but they don't it's not like they win out and and elevate themselves into a higher sort of understanding they they just go oh i i messed up and now i know why i messed up and i have to suffer the consequences and i think that's really cool because it's not they're they themselves are not um actualizing they're just understanding better the world that they live in and and having to happy to suffer you know their own uh the 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 mistakes that they've made moving through that lesson yeah putting it as you just did understanding the world in which they live in that kind of gets at i think what i was most thinking about uh with everything you were saying there i just kept coming back to how the act that they commit at the beginning 
it's for them, it's not even the context of like a wrongdoing. It's so right. normalized. It's just like we are just samurais. We are we are just, we are right. And what we do is we just, well, we just need to take what we want. We need we because along with the rape and the murder, they're scavenging food. It's as if it's just like a all in one pit stop where just to commit yeah. rape is no different from taking the food. It's just all like, oh, this is just what we do. And that's so That's right. There's the righteousness of it is is actually stated later on by the head samurai. He's like, We we are owed your like respect because we're the ones out there fighting to to keep things in balance but that to me is such like that's the like core flaw of of this philosophy that they have because what they consider balance or righteous somebody else would be like um hey i'm over here like getting raped or i'm the i'm the oppressed in that version of how you see the world like right you're it's- you're off. <laughs> the classic uh, justifying uh, wrongdoing for the greater good. Right. Kind and of who, de- who determines what that is, right? Usually it's the authoritarian who determines what the good is. And yeah. then the people underneath the foot of the authoritarian go, yeah, but I actually, you know, have something else to say here. Maybe if you'll let me. <laughs> well, just communicating all that in the opening scene is so well done. It's, it's something about the sheer numbers of the samurai who arrived, there's like 18 or 20 of them. Yeah. So it, it takes it out from this as a more of more, um, immediate, uh, like, um, uh, uh, last house on the left or some other kind of rape revenge mm-hmm. story where yeah. it, it, it does again, it, it just makes it. So it is just like, it's, it's no different from them. Just, just, the food. It's that the more people there are doing it, the more normalized it is for them. But then just to yeah, how it's indicative it's, of that sort of broader thing of like it's not just like there's a couple gnarly dudes who who happen to be samurai. It's like, no, this is a culture around yeah. all samurai right now. Which which shows is so how, different than a lot of depictions <laughs> that we've seen, right? Like, right. We're so used to seeing samurai held up on this pedestal of like their you know, great sort of honorable, et cetera, et cetera. And this is really kind of saying, hang on, there's there's this other side to things too. Yeah, and that that sheer amount, exactly. It's like there's no, even if it was a lesser amount, you always hope that through a tussle or something like that, there's some kind of chance of escape. But here it's just like, no, this is, the again, like kind of what you're getting at. The, the sheer amount of them is just representative of this is, impenetrable as society at large. There's no way to, because there's no way for them to physically overcome it then and there. Right. It's just shows it. And then also then just how the scene plays out. I mean, that was a detail thought was effective, but when they're walking away at the end, the way it just holds on the shot of them going off. And then we just remain looking at the villa at the little, at their little hut just kind of left to think about all that, yeah. all that just occurred and just their, their little farm life, their peaceful life that was just ruined. And then that <laughs> to top it all off, then we see it catching fire and the smoke coming out. And this is all just right after one of them just kind of grossly, rudely walks up to their little river and like, you know, swishes it around and, and spits it out. They're just, yeah. just tromping all over their peaceful little scene. And just where that, Oh, Opening Oof. up with that that same shot and having it feel peaceful and, and serene and all of that, this bamboo grove in the background. And then this the emergence of like one after another of the of the samurai, like how they it's it's eerie, man. It's super eerie. The just the way that they sort of come out of the bamboo grove, like they just just appear it's very ghostly honestly like and they're you know which i think is cool because they're not the ghosts they're just people yeah well it gives it's so eerie it gives that horrific sense of just where as p like uh, where you just get the sense of a peaceful home life but that at any given time a threat can step in beyond the boundaries and 
and destroy yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's uh, <laughs> yeah, the opening scene <laughs> and all that's going on as set up. Uh, God, yeah. It, it just starts with a bang story-wise too in that sense because then we're just we don't even have any setup with like okay here they are in their home life a bit we don't even know about the husband at all it's just god i love that is what a way to start a movie we don't even know the characters names and the scene plays out and this happens here it's just and then it keeps it up too where that whole first section is just uh a uh, uh it's like an action sequence almost, it feels like, of just a series of murders or not yeah. of whatever, what uh, revenge. I don't know if that changes the, the Vengeance word. murders, yeah. <laughs> Vengeance murders. But uh, these, these demon, ghost, cat people, women actively seeking their revenge on the samurai, the, 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 deaths, that, the deaths that are sowing the seeds of the, the tail that springs up that then... Yeah. Uh, spurs the governor to give this ordinance to track him down. But all that is just like, not only is it just energetically, entertainingly, what a way to start a movie, to have a first third of a movie that, that that's that, but almost stepping into the story, I always have the sense of, okay, well, everything that happens in the first third is what I thought like the whole movie was going to be stretched <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah. So then all of a sudden, it just allows for, whoa, so what is this story what what is it? Where is it going to go? What is this going to be? And just allows you to uh, go to wonderful places, which it did, and we'll continue to get into. Well, also, what I particularly like about the setup structure of this is that in modern ghost story horror, typically what we see is you see the outsider come in to the world. And then the the evil or or the the problem, whatever it may be, um, impacts them directly, and they have to figure out why. But in this one, we've been given the answer to the why up front, which is these band of of samurai committed a wrong. We get we get the wrong at the front. Usually in modern ghost stories, we're getting the wrong, the answer to the to the why, like what the wrong actually was in the, you know, like the end of the second act or or somewhere in the third end of the third act where we kind of go. It's like a aha moment of like, oh, that's why this haunting has been going on all along it's because some mm. you know some wrong was done and now we figured out what the wrong is and now we can solve it we can like do something about it but this is totally not that structure and i kind of i've i've complained about that structure a lot and to see a movie doing the the, the opposite like giving the why up front and then letting us see how that impacts everybody is really pleasing to me <laughs> well because it connects us more with the character who doesn't know what's going on when we know the answer we get to really see him struggle to like move through that world whereas when you don't know the answer you the audience are still taking up brain space to be like oh i want to figure it out with the character and that's fine that works in some realms it certainly works in like mysteries but like i think this is more effective actually in in a in a horror ghost story sense to be able to watch the character not know what's going on and try to figure it out while we do know it's sort of the same thing in slashers, right? It's like, we know the killer is right there. Like a lot of the time we're getting the POV of the killer. And so seeing the other person not know that the killer is right there is actually scarier for us because we're like, dude, he's right behind you. Yeah, it's so kind I, of, I don't know. I, it's I like, like the, it a lot. Getting that origin story up front in a uh, the route of, yeah, the route of getting the origin story up front, whether it's a slasher movie or a, a ghost movie of like usually off. And it's like, here's the flashback scene of the the right. wrongdoing and it occurred. Here well, it's I all just more think of the Conjuring movies where it's like, 
they're all set up for you to find out at the very end why this is all happening. Right. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I don't like, I mean, it, it makes, I don't like them. That's not it. So, Cause it never, it's never going to be, it never lives up to anything. It's just sort of like, oh yeah, they, right. th- they were killed by them and they got mad at that. Like it's, it doesn't yeah. make it spookier. Well, and that's, I mean, all that is the perfect way to set up what I think is the other big feat of this film for me, which is you have right straight up, as far as story wise, just outwardly, like what's causing them to turn into these things or whatever, there's no, there's no mystery to it, like what you were saying. And then throughout it too, we're we're with these ghost women like they're their own protagonist, fully showing them. They have scenes with each other, scenes with the human characters, all that. Yet the big the big feat I'm getting at is it still is so eerie and the way they're portrayed, it feels eerie in every scene, which God, like, and what a feat that is where you can have two characters as characters, yet it's not like we're sort of like, oh, hey, we're, it's, it's like Casper, we're comfortable with them. We're hanging out with these ghosts now. There's always just something off and unknowable and weird about them. And that's in the filmmaking itself, whether it's the incredible oh, yeah. lighting, the staging, the sort of theatrical way they're walking, whatever it is, everything that seems ghostly on every aspect, sound design, but then also just down to, again, this kind of the, how they kind of tiptoe around what they actually are by, I guess, by not tiptoeing around it. But like we have, I think at one point, the son asks the mother, well, what are you? And she says, well, we're, we're sworn, you know, and he says, are you, are you a demon? Are you human? What, what are you? And she's, well, we're sworn to secrecy. Like even there, there's always that element of known, even when we're with them and how much time we spend with them, it, it only adds to an unknown versus a known, which is like, how do you, God, I'm just, I'm just so impressed by that and fascinated by it. Well, and and like part of why it's so fascinating is because it's not simplistic. I mean, it is kind of, but it's not. It's nuanced, right? Like just like real life, humans are nuanced. They're not black and white. They're not just like, oh, you're this and that, you know, things are easy to, to define. Nothing is easy to define. It's all nuanced. So like they themselves are complex they have a point of view they have a problem for themselves they have like a point of view right they have desires they're not just oh we're these evil entities now i think there's a there's totally a time and a place for the unrelenting un sort of stoppable evil force but that's an entity and I think when it works the best, it's it's a singular entity. This is different. These are these were people that were wronged, and now they're living in a world where they have to deal with the consequences of that wrong. And they're that's what's interesting about them as that's what makes them kind of not the bad guy. the The evil is the bad guy, or the wrong is the bad guy. And everybody in the movie has to sort of navigate that. And you make decisions based on that. Some are good. Some are not good. Some are complex. And you also have agency to a degree, which is kind of the same as life. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like we all can do whatever the fuck we want, right? Like we can, but we have agency but we also have consequences because we live in the world with other people. So to have the, the characters that are exacting the broader bad guy, evil sort of actions or what's considered that by the, the other characters be in that realm of complex, you know, point of view and nuanced uh, you know, decision making is really compelling. You do not see that very often. Right. Cause the story, it kind of plays out where at first when they appear, 
he goes, he it's it's as if they aren't even, you know, he doesn't even recognize them at first, but then, or he does, but doubts it could actually be them. But then once he makes the connection, okay, this is definitely looks just like them. He's not wondering. It takes him a while to get to maybe there's some part of you that is still my wife and mother. He's he freaks out at first and is like, you aren't them. You're just demons. You're ghosts, whatever. And then he comes down from them and it's through their sort of, it's interesting how it's because they're kind of corporealized is why, mm. is maybe sort of what wins him over. And just as far, when you look at this, sort of the themes of... Um, uh, how I just want to say what is, you know, being the fact that he's, that she's his wife, but I guess the sexuality, as far as it, it's like a second seduction period that they go through where he, she, she has to win him over again, almost since now in her, her death or afterlife, but, but we don't actually know if what, what she is the whole time. But it's just super interesting how it's like they have uh, a second romance, essentially, is what wins him over. Um, well, that, I mean, that construct in this movie is so cool. You just taking sex, intimacy, on a spectrum and putting those up against each other, the sort of dichotomy between the opening scene and the, the quote unquote sex act of rape, like the worst version of that, the non-intimate, the, the, the dark side of that act. And then having somebody who represents the, the group that, that, uh, did that later have to sort of tepidly enter into true intimacy and, and like reconnect with that is such a, like holding the mirror up to the, the opening scene. Like to me though, like that's what I'm kind of talking about. It's like on this scale of like shadow, dark bottom of, of, humanity and like upper sort of um plane of existence of like true self or true you know what would you call it not actualization but like whatever that would be like uh, bigger than just your ego that's what they end up achieving as these two people but even in within that, there is a cost to that. I mean, that's really tragic shit. Right. She gets sent to hell as for, a result. For, for a, achieving the thing that we would largely consider the thing that like drives us, which is actual intimacy with another person. She broke her bond with the devil, and now she's... Uh, sentenced to an eternity in hell, or we know the word for it now, Jigoku, from our other friend, right, that's recent right. film, Jigoku. <laughs> well, I, I mean, guess, man, that is deep stuff. It, yeah, that's not even to, and that's just that's just his and his wife's relationship, right? Which well, is interesting. Even begin yeah. to touch on like like a father or father, a, a mother and son relationship, right? This the the relationship with his wife. It is interesting how when you look at just that romance story side of it, it is more like, it, it feels like we do have some kind of acknowledgement that there is still her in her, that there's still totally. some kind of good in her that she chose it that way. Well, she and had we the see ability to make that choice, which I think is really important, right? Because yeah. she didn't ha get to have a choice when she got raped. And then we see it's that then conflict within the mother is so interesting where she's, she's, oh God, it's so chilly when she's trying to tell him about all this and this is why it went down and this is what her fate was. While at the same time going through this whole, well, am I going to now fulfill my end of it and kill my son? That's ugh, so good. Um, well, yeah. 
some <laughs> how about some of the just the moments themselves and some of the filmmaking around it like you know i went over that first section where it's uh where we have them killing all the samurai but that so first good. one especially where where we see it play out in real time more yeah. or less it's incredible tim where first with her leading the samurai from the 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 gate or whatever it is mm-hmm. to the force and god i loved that where as soon as she appears we're like she's okay you know she looks like a ghost basically the way she's moving and the samurai says oh you must be a ghost and her response is kind of like oh no don't worry i'm not and he's just kind of like oh okay cool <laughs> and so with that <laughs> that's all the confirmation he needed uh she like glide leads him to their 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 domain and invites him inside of course he goes in but then to, the when she commits the murder i mean all of it leading up is super eerie the mom appearing coming out with a sake disappearing afterwards all that but then when the murder happens it was surprisingly violent where it just kind of reminded me, oh, this film's 68, not 58, you know, when right, it was made. Right. I think that I allowed for... the same thing. Yeah, that, that, that allowed for, oh, we've had more violence in films now. Or it's sort of at that juncture point. So when she, like a cat, I guess, bites his neck and we get some bloody <laughs> shots, like the details within that were incredible. Like when... When she holds out her arm at the beginning, it's the insert shot, and it's a cat arm. It's like this quick <laughs> yeah. insert shot. That's what I I had one of those Tim moments where I just went like, oh, <laughs> like it was. <laughs> yeah, God, that was that was chilling. It kind of reminded me of, oh God, I'm trying to think of it. There's some like famous. There's like a movie where it's like an eerie, furry ghost or something. We get in a glimpse. Well, Rosemary's Baby does. Yes, it that's what with, I was. That that's it. Yeah. That's it. I'm thinking of yeah. that. Oh God, yeah, uh, uh, it's chilling, chilling. And then the violence itself, where I loved the the particulars of how she was on top of him, chewing at his neck, and like leaping from his left to right side while keeping <laughs> her face over his neck and biting it. And then when we cut to the outside and see her silhouette, where she like flips her hair around twice and goes back to to biting like a full-on wear cat moment done in silhouette i god that whole sequence i just also so I mean, taken yeah, by there's there's a there's a key moment right before that when the mother is still there and you see her ponytail behind her wave like a cat's tail for like <laughs> right. one just one little flit of it and like he of course the the samurai who's there doesn't see this because it's behind her and he can't see that but like just that little detail of like oh right remember these are not actual human beings anymore these are something else is so intensely eerie and how about just that place itself and it's our kind of our our main location location throughout it but we have sort of this front entrance room or like the entertaining room where they bring each of the victims and later where they kind of um where any scene with gendoki when he's back takes place but just how it's it's like there's a rather where the rest of the house would be it's just a platform with no real walls that's just emerging out of fog it's as if like the whole oh you Surrounded know what you think by of the bamboo grove yeah it gives that sense of like if you're you know visiting a new house and you're out in the living room and then there's a hallway that leads to the rest of the house that you just never see it's as if that hmm. whole section of that house is actually just the supernatural gateway entry point like they're they're off in in ghost land <laughs> in demon land over there and just every yeah. time, I just didn't get tired of that as a device of just them walking in and out of this fog-drenched hallway to hell. Oh, my God. I, I loved that detail. Yeah, it's sort of living in this nether space. Yeah, exactly. And it's the so o- cool. original location of their house that burns down, we learned. Right. 
Yeah, I really like that. All of that stuff where you're kind of seeing the like the fabric of of the environment being blurred where it's like you either through double exposure or like superimposing sort of, you know, environment with with this the set. All of that is really compelling. I mean, I just mean, from a visual standpoint, it's that's, it's super cool. Right. That's exactly the other specific thing I wanted to point out was those shots where we had a sort of more in close up moving bamboo forest superimposed so behind the structure that they're in. Yeah. I, oh my God. Incredible. Just, just so incredible. Real uh, all of that quiet camera work and, and like quote unquote special effects work make every time one of them does this sort of gymnastic like flipping through the air or all of the wire work and stuff that's going on is so cool looking. Which had its strong roots in Kabuki theater. That's what was done in Kabuki right. theater, that wire work. It's so cool. Oh my God. And yeah. And then how it was lit on top of that too, where it's they're they're plenty bright, let's say, or mm -hmm. just some sort of really directional lighting, or maybe we do have it where they're more hidden in darkness and mystery and down to like the, editing itself feels ghostly when they're going around the forest we might get um like a quick repeat shot or yeah, there's a, a lot quick, of that or a quick shot where they they look another direction and it just the sense of space might be you know it's intentionally kind of off let's say where we we don't have exactly you know the where they're where they're where they are relationally in the space to each other, but it's just the mere mm -hmm. effect of like them looking that way versus that way. And just, Oh my God. I <laughs> was really floored with all that. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> the filmmaking. I mean, it, even in, in the actual environments too. I mean, those bamboo groves, like the way that that's shot and like the type of lenses that they're using to sort of create this really eerie depth within the bamboo grove mm -hmm. and then bl like super backlighting from far away. It, it creates this, it's just hard to even, you have to kind of just look at it. It's so cool looking, but so precise too. Like there are shots through the bamboo that kind of upwards and obviously they're using the sun as the light source and they're just aiming right at it, but they're diffusing the sunlight through the bamboo like layers and it creates this very ethereal kind of magical eerie thing and i think shooting all of this in black and white really is a service to that feel i i think you can do it in color but it would be a very different movie yeah no it's just classic like how the black and white lets you plug into the reality that much more it, it it blends the edges in a way it's really effective yeah widescreen black and white very effective choice for this film yeah. uh and it's some moments too even though it was black and white that was more on the extreme quite on uh side of things maybe i'm just thinking of particularly when we have oh it was fun that sequence actually where we have um our, our hero, I guess, Kintoki, we see him fighting, like, what do they call him? Like the bear or something? We see him fighting this, like, brute guy with a club in yeah. battle, which was actually, I really appreciated having some kind of just interjection of a scene that was, it gave some sort of reality to the greater war that's happening, just to right, see him right. battling this guy, then come back with his head or whatever. But that one shot when he's riding back, where it's just the sun fills oh the God. frame. It's 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 completely unnaturally massive, but just that the the giant sun with him on horseback riding across it, and it sort of takes a sec, and then the soundtrack, which is great in itself too, we can talk about, just booms in with those taiko drums. My God, that was it was incredible. Yeah, like that's the shot. Like <laughs> right? I want, I want, I want that framed on my wall it's so cool looking yeah that was in the trailer we just watched too it was great and the music pounding too which uh yeah opening credits music starts intensely is great mm -hmm. remember it being 
in a Oni Baba, I remember it being where it was, we had some upfront music, I want to say, but then it was super, super sparse. This had more, more music yeah. in it, but it was super effective throughout. Um, <laughs> well, well, you got any other, uh, Major things, anything more on like the the, the mother and that's sort and of him? The, the last stuff I have is just that whole third act essentially of like him him kind of coming to the understanding of what's going on, but still not really getting like he doesn't really know. He just goes, "Oh, things are like he knows that his wife is now gone." he thinks that potentially that was now actually her, even though during the whole exchange with her, he was always questioning that. Now that she's gone, he's like, oh my God, that was her. And now she's gone. So you must actually be my mother, right? Like, but he holds on to this like suspicion the whole time. And I, I mean, to me, the moment, I mean, it's very purposeful. The moment of them, him coming back and having his mom then be the person leading him back to the abode, as they call it, is just having, I don't know how to put this, the the transition of everything, it's the same, but everything is now different, where he's, we're, we're seeing the same actions, right? We're seeing a samurai show up at the gate, meet a ghost, have the ghost lead him through the forest back to their mysterious abode. Like all of that's the same construct, but now we're seeing it through a new lens and he's seeing it through a new lens. And we get this really great moment of the puddle where she's like, I'm not here to hurt you, but I am, she, you know, she's reverted back to killing people and he's kind of there. Like they both know, like this isn't going to end well, but they're all, they're both kind of, you know, putting on airs of like, yeah, we're just doing the thing that we've been doing, right? Everything's cool. And they get to the puddle and she does the mother thing, which I love, which is moms always overtly like stating the obvious because they're moms and they have to like, hey, watch out for this puddle. It's like, yeah, ma, I see the puddle. I don't need you like, I don't need you to warn me about the puddle. But that thing of like, that's such a mother thing. And something that his wife did not do with any of the other samurai, right? Like she never warned anybody about the puddle. She just jumped over it. Um, and him looking down into the puddle after his mom has warned him and seeing kind of this other version of her in the reflection of the puddle, it it does a bunch of really interesting things because it's, it's not explicitly saying anything. It's not saying, oh, here's the answer or here's like what we now know. But it is showing that her reflection is something different than what he's seeing. Hmm. And I think that's enough, right? That's enough for us to go, right, remember, these are not the actual humans anymore. It may be partially them, but they are a changed thing. And his reaction to that is to essentially attack her, right? Like they have to fight again. And I just think that that whole relationship of like uh, the the uncertainty of what is what the reality is is driving everything. And I, and I just think that's cool. And and I I think I like not having a, a distinct answer. Like we kind of vaguely know. Or at least we think we know. We have what the broad the strokes is. of, but we don't it, need this like, yeah, dun dun dun. Here's the answer. We've got it. No, it's it's enough just to kind of let you speculate, but not have an yeah. answer because they they couldn't give a satisfying. It's supposed to be left in the realm of right. essentially unknown and or unknowable. But then her sort of saying like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna sacrifice myself as well." very mother thing to do, but then also doing the whole trickery of coming back without the arm and, and like 
putting get like tricking him into giving her the arm becoming more of the monster version of herself i love that whole sequence that, what a great last set piece man that is wild <laughs> just to not so see good. her at all when she's convincing him to let her in she's right, just right. in voice to break his uh seven days of isolation and yes, then all of that stuff man it's so their good. kerfuffles so good her holding her uh her cat arm in her mouth and then jumping out <laughs> of the roof like yes <laughs> yes <laughs> amazing <laughs> So, yeah, I just think there's a lot going on in sort of terms of the story and the characters, like how they're moving through the story. But just as a, you know, viewing it casually, like it's so fun and cool looking. Yeah. And I think there'll be it's the kind of movie that offer more on subsequent viewings, too, because, you know, I'm just still just so caught up on the happenings and the visuals and that. But I just then keep reminding myself, like when you're talking about it, wait, this is his his mother in form of a, a demon ghost. Like, that's so loaded. Like, yeah. there's, there's so much going on there. Just the, the whole dynamic between them all that I just feel like I've still barely been able to scratch the surface of and just kind of There's so about much, it. right? Like, even him in that seven days of isolation, he just needs to hold out, like, another couple of hours. <laughs> can't and do he it. he can't, right? <laughs> he can't do it. That I love that kind of tragic stuff because... It's the same thing, right? It's us, the audience, going, no, 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 you're fine. Just wait. Just hold on, man. You're you're good. You'll be okay. Everything will be okay if you just hold on a little longer. It's so perfectly and, fable-esque of just like, yes, you yes. must do this for seven days. And on the final <laughs> day, he broke it. You know? Um, right. It's, it's great. Uh, yeah, almost, yeah, it feels like a quite on extended story. In right. In that sense. The... God, just uh, props to, if you talk about beginning strongly, but ending strongly, strongly, (laughs) ending ending on a strong note as well. The very last shot, Tim, just it it did it all for me of just kind of like how I was saying with the sequence of just letting us sit with the cats interacting with the dead bodies and just that, just building some kind of unspoken power or fervor, whatever. The last shot is just holding on a bamboo forest with some subtle wind and a distant cat meow. But the way (laughs) it holds on it, it just, it just says it all of there's this, this, what could be just a common sight, which is a common sight. There's so much more going on within it that we were just privy to more of, but in the end, it's still some sort of, in this case, uh, eerie mystery behind it all. God, I mean, yeah, it was, and it was just the kind of thing where it was holding on it, and at a certain point, I just got chills. You know, it, it right. held up just that long enough, and just left me on a perfect, the perfect kind of note that uh, maybe that also helped. That also helped lead to my buy it rating of just when a movie can just mm-hmm. be so affecting. Yeah, leave me on such an effective, affecting note. I'm literally chilled. Yeah, boy, that last shot. Yeah, I, I think broadly speaking to just the use of these these kind of themes of nature and man and how, what you know, we are existing in a world where both of those things exist and they collide into each other. But also that like in nature, there's balance and we can upset that balance and often do. But also in nature, there's there is inherent danger, too. If you mess with it, it will mess back. (laughs) You know, like so there's something really cool to, to that construct of we're we're living in the world right like we aren't the world the world is gonna do its thing around us regardless well, so find some balance or, <laughs> or else yes agreed though i want to say i think a lot of what the horror is getting at can be personified just by how you're speaking about it we're 
I think that's a subtle thing that's creeped into our language where we, how you just framed that was as we and nature as separate things, which is not true at all. Like, yeah, a wave can come and kill us. That's where that that comes from, you know, like <laughs> hurricane, earthquake, it does a grizzly bear can maul us. But that's, I don't know, but I don't know. And our language has helped supported it. But the fact that we are some kind of just actual separate entity and nature is another force to be fought back against. Like, like I know that's not well, what that's, you're saying, but that that exists just inherently in the way you're just right. trying to, to, to speak about it. And I mean, that, that acknowledgement, that like sort of hidden acknowledgement or feels like a hidden truth is so much about what this kind of movie gets at and anything that sort of gets at the inextricable link between yeah. nature and man and um, those boundaries that are imaginary. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, you're saying what I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in that when we as a as a thing that exists in nature and uh is not separate from it when we decide that we are separate or think that we are that's when you get into trouble you're moving away from the other side of it which is being a part of it in harmony with it because we are all part of the same thing it's it's ecosystem you know stuff and we as a species have had a tendency to move away from the ecosystem version of the world. And when you do that, <laughs> you know, you run a lot of risks because you're, you know, you're going against a sort of very natural thing that it, that already exists and you're messing with it. Don't mess with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're making uh, bargains with the devil here, which is that's right. It could be a metaphor I love that for all kind your of morality. Saying construct of like you know balance just fun. i mean i'm sort of beating a dead horse here but like the balance of of existence yeah it's kind of like uh i mean it's this the stage we're at now is just making me think of the south park where it's like they for uh, the the grandparents generation made a bargain with man bear pig i guess or is it some other evil monster to like leave them alone or to, I don't know. It's, it's just about not, not acknowledging that reality of all the ways we're destroying the world because we just want our, our conveniences uh, to remain and not go away. Uh, yep. I, <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't really going anywhere with that. For some reason I was just thinking about, um, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll just say, yeah, every day we're in some way, making that deal with the devil it feels like when we're living in a <laughs> in a, a a world built on unjustness yeah well <laughs> on that note right <laughs> yeah i mean that was pretty much it for me i'm sure i could find more little examples but that's what i had as far as there's what so worked. many little things that you know we could go on and on forever we yeah. should just watch the movie which, yeah, you should. I, we hope you did. If not, do it. And we'll watch it again someday, too. All right. Well, if there was anything, then sounds like we're set to move on to our next section. What did not work? It's not ready yet. Seems to work okay. No, something important's missing. What did not work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Nothing for me. There was a there was a couple moments when I like I thought maybe I wasn't into the 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 kind of um theatrical set kabuki kind of set um construct cuz it 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 like made me think of like the insidious movies where they're like really breaking the reality and, and being like, now we're in this theatrical space. But it, it was fine in this movie. It worked fine. It yeah, didn't, it wasn't really a, there's so it much. It didn't go into a place of, of, of like 
unreality that that felt wrong, I guess. No, because the it feelings fit. were real behind it. The, yeah. It felt it felt justified. It felt like, well, how yeah. do we? This is just helping to get at the power of the situation by being so uh, filmically forceful and stylistic about it. Yeah. So I I don't know. I don't really have anything. Um, I noticed the uh, wig mesh on one of the characters in a close up at one point. I was like, <laughs> right. Oh, like, what are you going to say? Something to criticize? <laughs> like, you could see the wire and the wire work. Like, so what? Like, yep. Oh, nah, this whatever. Is great. <laughs> great. Well, I think we'll have no more for our next section then. Here we go. Yep. Things of note. Things of note. <laughs> this should be interesting. Well, I made it through a lot of the special features that were on there. Oh, and nice. I, I read some um some essays on the Criterion website. Uh, but yeah, it was fun. There was actually a full like hour long interview with the uh, director. I made it just about halfway through and then just um, a film, a more recent interview with a Japanese film critic talking about uh, Kaneto Shindo. Some interesting things uh, he mentioned. Thought it was interesting like how ghost films had a tradition of being released in the summer months. Uh, hmm. It was funny when I was watching something on uh, like haunted houses in Japan and the popularity there. And they said that that was because people thought of, they liked things that were chilling during the hot summer months. So maybe there's <laughs> some kind of truth to that. But what this guy said was that summer months is when the Buddhist holiday Bon, B-O-N happens, which is when people would invite the spirits of their deceased family members into their homes. Oh, so okay. That was the association for that. He at least come for ghost films being released in the summer months, which I just think that's so interesting, you know, compared to here we were just getting in the fall mood is when we think of horror and ghostly things. So to have that be distinctly different, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. And then the filmmaker Kaneto Shindo is learning about him. It was interesting. You know, I mean, think of it. It was a pretty same, similar dynamic in the other film we watch of his is Oni Baba of just a small family unit that's uh, mm -hmm. w women-centric, women-run. There are main characters uh, at victims of crazed samurai. So, like, all right. things that were important to him as far as he was close with his um, mother and sister, I believe, and had a wife who died at a younger age after four years of them being together. So he always had all of them in mind with making his films. And he's from a poor farm life, grew up kind of um, uh, when he was a kid, depending on his brother for some income, and then uh, went off to try to be a filmmaker. But all that stuff appears in his films as far as like things that are important to him of the portraying this, 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 the small, simple life as sort of, the ideal life um, portraying samurai as savage brutes was, you know, a big thing to him, sort of a contrast against the Kurosawa nobleman mm -hmm. samurai. Um, themes that were really important for him were work and sex, which were the roots of human nature, as I think right. this critic uh, put it. Which was fun. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, no, talked about... I mean, this was kind of a, w a different way to put what I was kind of getting at where I, I first said what was so cool about this. They use the term animism in Japan, which is the idea of the Japanese see spirits within inanimate objects, within places, animals. Everything is sort of imbued with a spirit, you know, is how they view things. So um, there are many, there are many, what do they say? There are many like fables and stories about humans and animals being connected through things like love and hate, that there's always animal ghost stories in their culture, you know, with not, not just regular ghosts, 
but uh, more more animal ghosts are there in their culture too. Um, and that cats are specifically of interest for them because uh, they, they're they not obedient, as they put it. <laughs> they sort of represent <laughs> an unpredictable nature. Uh, Fair. Oh, yeah. I thought the, all that was interesting. It was, yeah, it was fun to hear about his story too of sort of, Going the wanted to be a director at first, but that was too competitive, too many assistant directors, so focused on screenwriting, but then wrote his first film, which he said was 70% autobiographical about him and his wife passed away that he just felt like he just had to make this one movie that was so personal to him. And because it sounded wow. like he was just a good guy and had the right connections, was able to get a first movie off the ground that he wrote. Nice. Yeah. Um, do you have anything? Uh, no. I mean, it was supposed to go to Cannes in 68, but, um, that, uh, that year the festival was canceled. Um, yeah, because through- France was having some unrest. Yes. <laughs> 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 I read that too. Uh, cool. That's all I, don't I got, know. though. I felt like there was more I wanted to say than these special features, but I think, I don't know, maybe it just took more to took more to take in than there actually was. I don't know. That's all I have. The well, uh, woman who played uh, his wife, this was like her big debut. Um, and that and was she his... Went on to, she went on to be in a ton of stuff. And that actually was his wife, too. Or no, sorry, the, the woman... The mother is his wife. Is the director's wife. Is the director's wife, yeah, who was yeah, in a bunch of his movies. Yeah, the woman who played the main character guy's wife. Um, Kawako Taichi, I think, maybe. Um, yeah, she. this was like her big, you know, what do you call that? Debut. It was <laughs> yeah. her big debut. And then That's she cool. crushed it for 20 more years or whatever. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Actually, here's a last little fun detail about his progression as a filmmaker. He had, you know, his different mentors he was friendly with and uh, was kind of struggling with this. You know, I'd written a bunch of screenplays, but one of the one of his mentors, the directors he looked up to or, or wrote for said something the effect of to him, you know, these these films like, yeah, they're they're there's no actual like, where's the drama? Where's the actual story to them? These are just events happening. You know, it's like you're, I forget how he put it more eloquently. You just gave me a face. Uh, <laughs> does that not make any sense? I mean, I think that that's, I don't know. I don't, I think his films, that that's kind of part of what makes him good. No, 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 no. That was the, those his unproduced screenplays back when he was still oh, an oh, earlier okay, filmmaker. Okay trying to get gotcha. things off the ground. So what this mentor told him was, yeah, you need to like get better at the, the drama side of it. Like that's that what's, what makes a story a story. So he read 43 volumes of what was called a, a compendium called Collective Collected Modern Theater, collection of, hmm. of theater. And he read three of those a day for a year and a half. It took him to get through it all Jeez. and yeah. just treated it as his education. And that's Smart. sort of what he gave to, you know, that's what he credited for then just, you know, took that feedback to heart kind of thing, which was hard for him. And he fully gives the credit to his wife, who then later passed away at the early age for basically encouraging him to stick with it after all that. Wow. That's, that's cool. All right. Well, then that's what I have. I knew there was a cool. little something more. That was fun. Great. All right. Well, if that is it for Kuro Neko, we like to wind down with some recommendations for each other and you. Tim, anything you'd like to recommend Ed, this week? I've been watching Castle Rock. Have you heard of this? Oh, yeah. That's the Hulu one with Jane Levy. Uh, not Jane Levy. It's... um. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Who am I thinking of? She's in another Hulu horror show, I want to say. Maybe I'm getting them mixed up. Damn it. What's her name? I've uh, 
I can't. I is can't it believe I can't. Lizzie think of it. Kaplan. No. Uh, yes. Thank you, Lizzie Kaplan. Oh, Jane Levy was in the show, but uh, not in the se- the season I'm watching. I'm watching okay, the second okay. season. Great. Um. Yeah, uh, Lizzie Kaplan, who I've had the pleasure of email correspondence with because I had to organize something that she was involved in. Um, Boom. Very lovely person. Really good actor. Uh, but the the second season, man, oof, it's cool. It's dark. What? Did you skip <laughs> over the first season? What? Uh, yeah, you there can I don't know actually if they're how connected they are, but you don't need to have seen the first season to see the second season. Um, is my understanding at least. And yeah, the second season is essentially Lizzie Kaplan is playing. Um, Annie Wilkes from Misery, but it's like an okay. origin story. Got it. And yeah, I'd watch that, dude. It is. It's cool. It's dark. You know what I was saying to to Brit is that like it kind of if you stripped all of the supernatural stuff away, it would still be a really good show. So like the story, the interpersonal sort of drama that's going on in the town and the characters, like the their plight is is enough but then you add on top of it this weird like other like what is going on very stephen king like like people are people coming back from the dead or 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 are people losing their minds and thinking that the person somebody's come back from that you know what i mean there's this ambiguity of like mystery and and like possible supernatural stuff that's going on and it's cool. It's super dark and eerie. So, you know, and like really, really good storytelling. So get into it. Great. I'll watch the first season, I guess, at some point, but whatever. This one's <laughs> really cool. <laughs> cool. I, thanks for reminding me about that one. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll recommend Dead. Just looking at what I watched in recent months, last month. You know, one that I have, I don't know if I can actually say it's like a good movie, but just one that like, I just kind of have a soft spot for, or just there's enough that I really like in it and that a lot of people overlooked is uh, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. It came out <laughs> in 2017 by director Luc Besson, you know, who it's oh, just, yeah. it just does not reach the sort of, incredible heights that the fifth element does but there's some really fun i think the good term is gonzo elements to it just in the the planet and the creature design and just all those sci-fi things are just are just really really fun and i have a soft spot for and is one that uh not a lot of people saw so admittedly i don't know if it's actually good probably isn't definitely not i would say it it's not a good movie. Okay, you actually seen it. Okay. Oh, I've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> but, but you it get is the appeal. visually and and design and sort of world building, like cool for sure. I agree with you. Yeah, uh, the the Rihanna scene is so incredible. <laughs> oh my god, there's a lot of yeah. It's a it's a weird movie. In fact, I feel like it's a movie that you could, like could potentially down the line become a little cultish. There you go. A little plant in the seed of, of that, if that's ever a possibility. Yeah. I've, I've, yeah, it, it, that's how I feel about it. Great. Cool. All right, nice. Tim. Well, maybe you can stir the hat for us and I'll tell you when to stop. We'll decide what we're watching next week here. Stop. The Last Man on Earth from 1964. Cool. This is the one that's, I don't know if I've seen it, but it's like the I Am Legend story. Oh. That one. This okay. is like This is like the original that one. God, I feel like maybe I, I don't know. I'll have to look. It, it, I think I might have seen part of this. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> we will. We'll find out soon enough, in fact, for episode 100. 59 of Dismembering Horror. Until then, you can find us wherever you found us. Our big ask is you uh, tell a friend that uh, you like to podcast this much that you made it this far to hear us saying tell a friend right now. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and always happy. Uh, send us a message on Instagram. You want to see a movie, uh, see us cover a movie. We'll, we'll get to it lickety split. If not, just adding it to the hat. That's our favorite to do. Agreed. Great. Well, if, if that's it, Tim, then... Uh, I'm the hiccups. <laughs> Tim, so that means we it's better go. time to go. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, in closing, whether she's a demon or your wife or your mother, thanks for listening. Yep, yeah, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.